Anyway, so we kick off a week. Um, people join us if, if anyone else comes in. Uh, this particular talk, as part of the uh, Dublin Anarchist Book Fair, is to mark the 30th anniversary of the British miners' strike of 1984, the massive strike which saw miners and their communities uh, the length and breadth of the country engage in a massive battle, not alone for their future and the future of their communities, but also for the future of the type of trade unionism that they believed in, uh, a trade unionism based on solidarity and resistance. It was a battle that I suppose involved everybody. It was impossible not to take sides. And it was a war whose legacy lives on today, both in terms of community and, indivi and individual memory and in terms of its political legacy, not just in Britain, but here too. And oftentimes it's worth thinking about how different our political landscape would be today if the miners had managed to defeat Thatcher and Thatcherism as they came very close to doing. Uh, Dave Douglas, who's going to speak to us, was centrally involved in the events. He's been a member of the National Union of Mine Workers since 1963. He was an official of the Miners' Union, a branch official and an executive member for about 24 years. He's a retired member now after being a full member for 49 years or so. And he has previously edited the revolutionary miners' paper, The Mine Worker, in the 1970s, and also a local newspaper called Hot Gossips, which lampooned the officials of the mine, the managers, the government, etc. Uh, Dave is going to share with us his experiences and memories of, the, of 1984, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions, comments, discussions, an opportunity for all of you to share your own memories of the time, if you're old enough, to, uh, or to talk about its enduring legacy, because I think no matter what age you are, if you care about social justice, equality or trade unionism, the miners' strike will, to have some extent, impinged on your political consciousness. So I'd just like to introduce uh, Dave Douglas, and as I said, he's going to talk for about maybe 20 minutes, is it, Dave? <laughs> I think it'll be a little bit longer than that. Longer than that. Whatever <laughs> length he's going to talk for. Big... And there will be time then for questions, comments yeah. and discussions, all right? Just get the hook out on it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, 30 years ago... Um, it, it, in fact, it seems incredible that it is 30 years ago. Um, Britain faced its biggest uh, conflict, social, economic, political, of at least a century. Certainly bigger and more important, in my opinion, than the, the 1926 general strike because the outcomes are more terminal. Um, anybody who thinks this was just about a job and keeping a job is going to severely miss the point. Neither is it about particularly whether a, a field in far off Barnsley has a pit head in it or not. Again, you'll be missing the point. Because what this, man, this um, massive conflict was about was a clash of two social classes and two ideologies diametrically opposed to each other. Now, I'm not just saying that in some kind of romantic, <coughs> theoretical fashion. It's literally true that the miners for nearly two and a half centuries had been the mainstay of radical resistance in Britain across a whole fields of uh, agendas, not least um, being the central core of the, of the physical force wing of the Chartist movement, for example. Half of the miners executive were half of the executive of, the, of them. They were co-founders of, of the Labour Party, co-founders of the Communist Party, they um, had traditions far to the left, my own traditions, for example, with the IWW and uh, industrial unionism. The NUM, of course, is an industrial union built on the model um, that emerged from the miners' next step. Uh, we depend on each other at work for physical solidarity and survival. It's, you can't be a loner down the pit. You'd be no good to anybody. You have to be a team player and you have to actually care about the whole of your collective to do the job and stay alive and because of the communities that we live in being cheek by jowl to the actual pit and working shifts the community lived out of each other's pockets really and minus kids um, are sort of uh, generational well, when, when the miners in 1984 talked about um, our forefathers, academics thought we were speaking figuratively. We weren't. We were talking literally. We were literally talking about what dads were granddads were great granddads. And the job isn't a job you come and go from. It's a, it's a job you're born into. It's a community you're born into. We have very close set of sets of values. Now, sometimes that's a great strength. 
Other times it's just bloody nosiness. And, uh, you know, <laughs> having an open door is all right if you want the people in there to come and go. But we, have, we really did have a very, very strong communities and social values. The union was built upon principles not only of a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, but actually challenging the ownership of the bakery. The abolition of capitalism was a tenant of our union rules since its foundation. And our vision of society was one that we politically engendered uh, for a long time. Now, on the other side, Thatcher had come to office after waging a determined faction fight inside the Tory party for her brand of extreme free marketism. Uh, she, she had a faction fight against Heath and the uh, One Nation Tories, who she regarded as soft. It's always amused me when people think that 84 had something to do with her getting revenge for Ted getting uh, kicked out. I mean, she hated Ted Heath. She'd have kicked him out in, herself if uh, she could have done. Um, so it wasn't about that. Uh, her view, of course, was uh, the, this version, this outside of the Atlantic's version of the neocons, the idea that the, the market was sovereign and that the market should have nothing to interfere with it, that profits should go as high as they, they can ever get to and, and individual wealth can go as high as it wants to go, while poverty can go as low as you like. You can, and there'd be no particular wage that people wouldn't work for and no conditions people wouldn't work in. She didn't believe, believe you could book the market. The market was sovereign. Now, she had lots of peripheral objections to other things like councils, for example, which I think she's seen as some kind of harbinger of socialism. The idea of municipalisation of gas and water and electricity and all that were anathema to her. But more than, more than that and more fundamentally than that were trade unions because trade unions regulate the rate of exploitation. And she didn't think that we should do that, that unions should have any kind of power or say whatsoever. So it was illustrative right from the start that if she was going to drive through a programme, a battle with the unions was coming. And in, in particular, a battle with the National Union of Mine Workers. The, the National Union of Mine Workers were the prop forward of the trade union movement. And she writes in her autobiography that this... This was, uh, this was on the cards. So we know that they're, um, that they're going to come for us. Now, the argument was fundamentally about different visions of society and different visions of worth. What was worth? For us, whether a pit was profitable or not really wasn't our business. We, we mined coal. If there was coal there, miners should mine it. How they dealt with profits and all the rest of it was up to them. But there was an argument, and a very strong argument, that there never were any economic mines in Britain. Um, Britain produces, as a matter of fact, the cheapest deep mine coal in the world. I've got some figures here, but more particularly the, they're, they're in the book. Um, but the argument was waged around this question of profitability and non-profitability. So, just to give you um, the, an, a, an idea, um, the Coal production costs in 1979, Belgium, 58 pounds, <coughs> France, 45 pounds, West Germany, 41 pounds, and the UK, 29 pounds. Uh, on top of this, the subsidies which were given um, as direct aid per tonne. Belgium, 34 pounds, 5, France, 17 pounds, 96, West Germany, 41 pounds, UK, 1 pound, 62. And um, if you looked at the kind of global figures you're talking about, you're talking about hundreds of millions against tens of millions in the coal industry. And if you went outside of the parameters of Europe into look at places like uh, um, Colombia and places like um, uh, Latin America that were sending coal over uh, with subsidies of £78 per tonne against £1.62 in Britain. So there never ever was an argument really, about pits being closed because we're uneconomic. In her adult brain, the idea was really that she wanted to privatise the coal industry. And she wanted a coal industry that had no union in it. That was the bottom line of it. She had no objection to coal particularly. It was coal miners she didn't like. And uh, so her idea was to lock off the, part, the parts that she thought were the least profitable um, 
get rid of them, and, um, and keep a rump industry, still a massively massive industry, uh, but with a non-union, big carrot and stick, uh, agency workers, etc., coming in. That was the, that was the, that was the plan. Um, so, first of all, that we knew that there was uh, there was going to be this uh, this fight coming, and in 1981, Derek Ezra came along and said that there would he was going to close uh, 30 pits and take 35,000 jobs out of the industry. This is 1981. Now. Um, as soon as that happened, men just walked out of the pit. They went on strike. Nobody had any ballots. We didn't have any conferences. We were being attacked. So you responded to the attack. And pits picketed each other out. And it had a domino effect and started to, the whole country started to come out. Nobody ever complained at that particular time about us not having the ballot because it was successful. They realized that they, were, they weren't ready for us. Um, and they backed off. And... Thatcher says in her autobiography, or McGregor says in his autobiography, as the chairman of the coal board, um, that she retreated from the field if somewhat bloodied and went back to prepare for us. I should say, really, as a prelude to that, that this whole idea of taking us on had went back a long time. A man called Myron in 1973 had first drawn up an idea that they would privatise the industry and break the union. And then in 1979, a man called Nicholas Ridley sat down with a, um, a strategy document of how to engage the National Union of Mine Workers and defeat us. A whole range of things were recommended. One, that all power stations would be dual fuel so they could burn oil and coal, so there was no coal to just burn oil in it. That they would stop welfare payments to miners' wives and children, um, incidentally, payments to criminals' wives and children weren't affected, I'm not, I'm not a vindictive person, but as a matter of fact, the family of the Yorkshire Ripper, a mass murderer, was £17 a week better off than the family of a strike in Yorkshire Minor, for example, which tends to show you the priorities of the thing. Um, they would aim to shift the delivery of coal from rail, unionised rail and unionised transport and wherever possible to have owner-operated lorries, so you owned your own lorry and you had a vested interest in getting through that there'd be the development of a mobile national police response body that could go anywhere around the country without constraints. And ultimately, that the long-term solution would be the, to, to break the power of coal and to shift to nuclear energy. Nuclear energy was seen as a benign workforce and a benign power source as against the politics of power that revolved around the coal industry. So that was a plan that they drew up. What people don't realise is, although they maybe know about the, the Ridley plan, is that the Labour government, when it came to office after Ted Heath's demise, um, also drew up a strategy of how to engage the miners and defeat them. And central to that strategy was the uh, his social contract. And the mining end of the social contract was to bring in an area incentive scheme. Now... The miners' union since 1912 had fought for a single day wage system. So if you're a miner in Wales or you're a miner in Kent or you're a miner in Scotland, you earned the same wage for what you did, as opposed to different bodies. Now, we were a confederated union. We were more of a confederation than a national union insofar as people were belonged to areas and the areas confederated and it was called a national union, although it really had few features of a national union as such. What the coal owners had been able to do was to set one set off against another and pay more money to one area and more, less money to another area and change the whole thing around. So people had identified with areas rather than with a national perspective. The coming of the National Power Loading Agreement in 1966 meant that men earned the same money whatever job they did and wherever they worked in the country. Now this was absolutely profound effect when it came to the strikes of 1972 and 1974 because people looked to the national negotiating team and the, the strength of the national union rather than area identities and their own backyard. And without that, we probably wouldn't have won the ballots in 72 and 74 to have strike action. The aim of Callaghan was to reintroduce an area incentive so that people would be paid according to what area they worked in and how much coal they produced, etc. Now, some areas are are easier than others. If you worked in Nottingham, for example, you could have 8-foot, 10-foot, 12-foot coal seams 
with massive machines. If you worked in South Wales or parts of Durham and Northumberland, you might be lying on your side uh, working in a two and a half foot seam. And uh, so the men in Nottingham and Leicester started to earn more money in bonuses than we were earning in wages. And the, a disparity started to build up. But that's jumping ahead of myself, really. Um, the next thing that happened was in 1983, Lewis Merthyr colliery went on strike in Wales, again over premature closure, and again the men in Wales downed tools and started picking out the country. We'd had a meeting in, in Yorkshire that said that the Yorkshire miners would come out on strike. Again, we weren't talking about ballots here, we were talking about solidarity. People turned up at your pit and said, we want support, you went on strike to, to support them. And it was rolling on before it again. Unfortunately, somebody advised the Welsh miners, and I think it was probably Kim Howells, who was a great friend of Neil Kinnock, to, um, to have a national ballot. And when we went to the national ballot, we lost the national ballot. So although the Yorkshire area, for example, voted in favour of supporting the strike, um, other areas didn't, and the Welsh miners felt utterly defeated, and it looked like it was going to... Um, it was going to skittle the whole thing. So the mark and time strategy of the government and the coal board was that they would continue to build stocks. In the three years between 1981 and 1984, they ran another 9.8 million tonnes of coal to stock. So by the time of the start of the strike, there was 47.8 million tonnes of coal in stock. So our, our strategy was to impose an overtime ban. We put an overtime ban on, which meant you didn't cut coal at weekends, which we didn't tend to do anyway, uh, all between shifts. But it also meant you couldn't get down the pit on a Monday because it had to be inspected. So we were only working four days a week. Um, and so the levels of coal going to stock started to reduce and they started to bite into it. Six months before the start of the strike, Lord Marshall, the head of the Central Electricity Generating Board, goes to Thatcher and says, according to our sums, if this overtime ban stays on until August, a strike of one month will shut all the power stations down. It'll put the lights out. If you allow this overtime ban to continue where it was. So McGregor comes to um, Thatcher with his hit list. 75 pits, 75,000 jobs. And somebody sent it to Scargill. Somebody sent the list to Scargill. And Scargill goes on the press and says, look, they're going to shut these pits. Every single national newspaper in Britain called him a liar. Every single television channel had the coal board and the government saying, he's making it up, we've no intention of closing down these things. Now, the, uh, the uh, cabinet papers have just been released. And there, lo and behold, in the cabinet minutes is the presentation of the pits, the percentages of people that are going to uh, lose their jobs, and all the rest of it. And Thatcher actually says in the cabinet minutes, we shouldn't refer to this document again. So, so that they can keep it, keep it uh, undercover. They wrote every single miner in Britain a letter in June saying, Scargill's told you that we intend to close 75 pits. It's not true. If it was true, I wouldn't blame you for being annoyed. Well, we've all got a copy of this letter. I've got mine framed. Uh, and, of course, they were telling us utter, a direct, barefaced, bloody lies. Um, so... You know, there wasn't any secret about it, but, but McGregor says to Thatcher, the date that the strike will start is the 6th of March, 1984. He goes and gives her the date of the start of the strike. And again, the, the story is released. It's released in the business magazine, business executive magazine. Um, and McGregor you know, says, no, 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 I, I didn't, I, you misquoted me. But actually, McGregor owned the magazine. So the fact of him being misquoted by his own staff is very, very unlikely. So there's no argument now anyway whether he was misquoted or not because he was obviously telling the truth. Now, our intention, as I say, was to leave that overtime ban on until about September of 84. But the, the, the way they thought they would handle it was they would throw down the gauntlet that we'd have to pick up. Paul Mees in Scotland, Snowden in Kent, and more particularly and provocatively, Cottonwood in Yorkshire. Now, in typical coal board style in Yorkshire, the manager of the pit threw up in the window and shouted to the union secretary who was walking up the road, the pit's shutting. Um, that's what passes as negotiations. 
and uh, the miners immediately went on strike at Cottonwood and they started appealing for support from the rest of the, the miners in Yorkshire. Every single branch in Yorkshire voted uh, that they would take strike action alongside the men in Cottonwood. Now, I make this point because Arthur Scargill doesn't work at Cottonwood. And he didn't work at any Yorkshire pit. He was a national president by then. He wasn't based in Yorkshire. So the decision to go on strike in 1984 wasn't his. It was ours. So when we read in papers, you know, Arthur Scargill called the miners on strike, it's utter bollocks. You don't call miners on strike. Miners go on strike. He happened to be in the national executive, the chairman of the National Executive Committee. And we had to go for approval from them to say that the strike was official, which they did, and also the one in Scotland. So what we started to have was rolling along domino effect of pits going down, pits going down. McGregor's plan had been that he would throw this hit list on the table, we would go away and have another national ballot, which we would lose, and then the pit closures would go through. But by the time he put his list on the table, only three mines were working. The whole country was out on strike, all bar three mines. So we'd actually spiked these guns by having the thing rolling, rolling before it, uh, rolling all, uh, everything before it. Now, uh, the, um, the point about the ballot, we expected to have a national ballot, um, us and the leadership. And we had a special delegate conference where we decided to change the rules from 55% um, to a simple majority of 50 plus one in order to, to win the ballot. Well, we had to come back to the branches and ask the branches if they wanted to have a ballot. Now, those 1,800 men worked at my pit. And when I got on the platform, I was booed. I was booed by 1,800 men saying, don't you come back here asking us about a bloody ballot when we've already been on strike and we've already shut down the coal field. They thought we were trying to ballot ourselves out of the strike. They thought we were going to say, oh, you know, we were ready to fight, but the men wouldn't back us up. It wasn't true. But, you know... With the assistance of some of the left paper sellers, <laughs> they put this rumour out that that was, that, was what we were, that was what we were going to do. We had no intention of doing that. But the point was, every single branch uh, in Yorkshire decided they didn't want a ballot because we were already on strike. Now, we went to a special national conference in April. There were 8,000 miners outside milling about singing, stick your ballot up your arse to the tune of Bread of Heaven, which I thought was a... Strange kind of a song to set it to, but it <laughs> tended to give you the uh, flavour of how they felt. And in that national conference, there were seven resolutions from different areas. Five of the resolutions called for a national ballot. Two didn't. Call said, th th they said that we're on strike, you should just respect picket lines. Now, you got five bites, you got seven bites of the cherry, really, six bites of the cherry, because all of them in favour of the having a national ballot, could vote five times. You voted for the top one, that fell. You voted for the second one, you voted for the next one. So you had an exhaustive vote going, going through. Now, this is after every man who worked in the pit had been along and expressed his point of view and voted. And every branch had voted and every area had voted, and this was a national conference. And when it went to the vote, the majority was we didn't have a ballot, we were already on strike, respect picket lines. So rightly or wrongly, other people think we should have had a ballot or not. The decision not to have a ballot was made by that conference and by the miners. And here's the final thing on that. Arthur Scargler was in the chair. He didn't represent any area, so he didn't move any resolution from an area. In fact, because he was in the chair, he didn't speak on any of the resolutions. And the only time he spoke in the entire conference was to call upon everybody to respect each other's opinion and to walk out of the conference united. That's the only time he spoke. So when I read in some of these uh, academic books that Arthur Scargill stopped the miners having a national ballot, again, it's utter bollocks. He didn't make a decision on that. We were in favour of having a ballot. The membership didn't want a ballot because they thought we were trying to sell them down the river. So again, however, whether it was a right or wrong tactic, and I happen to think if we'd went back in October and had a national ballot, we would have won it because the coal board commissioned three national opinion polls and said that eight out of ten of the people on strike would vote in favour of, of strike action. So we would have won it, but that's an academic point, perhaps. The way in which the, um, the police moved into this operation was 
are totally unprecedented. The, you know, a strike isn't illegal. It's not supposed to be illegal. It's supposed to be a civil thing. Even picketing's a civil uh, offence. It's not meant to be a criminal offence. But from day one, the police treated this question as if we were breaking the law, that picketing was illegal, being on strike was illegal, and they had some kind of personal interest in breaking the strike. Now, at first, the police were reluctant to get heavily involved, and Thatcher went to them in a typical Hectoran style and said they must carry out more vigorous policing. Now, prior to that, um, prior to that situation, um, the Association of Chief Police Officers, which is the commanding officers of all the forces, had got together and set up a national, what they call the National Reporting Centre, where they would conduct the national uh, direction of police against the, the, the miners' pickets. Now, police forces in Britain are supposed to be controlled by council police committees who vet the budget and vet the operations and say yes or no. For the first time, the government, without any debate in Parliament, decided it would underwrite and ignore the wishes of police committees and direct the police here and there. A classic case was at Orgreave. The, 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 there's a lots of photos downstairs, which I hope you look at, by the way. In, in, in the Battle of Orgreave, the Rotherham and Sheffield councils, police committees, refused the budget for the cavalry to be riding about in that field and the, uh, or any of those mass police operations that they did there. And the government underwritten and said, we'll give you whatever you want to do whatever you want for the more vigorous police than that they'd, that they'd asked for. The National Stolen Vehicle Computer, where you put in the stolen vehicle registration number, and if you go down any motorway or any place where the CTV things are, we'll pick up the registration number. They put every miner's car registration into the stolen police vehicle computer. So that wherever miners went anywhere in the country, you would know where they were going at any particular, any particular time. Absolutely unprecedented actions that they took against us. And, and I mean, after the debacle at Orgreave, of course, they chased us back into the villages. The second front strategy was that they would put a scab in every pit in Britain. Even if it was one scab and you needed 5,000 cops to get them through the gates, that's what they would do because it stopped the pickets going to different parts of the country and, uh, and trying to stop the Nottingham Coalfield. The Nottingham Coalfield was only producing on one shift sometimes, depending on how many pickets we could get through to persuade them not to, not to do it. Um, after all grief, they managed to start two shifts because we weren't picketing there. Of course, they put roadblocks on. I'm proud to say that I organised the first motorway blockade in Britain and in retaliation to the roadblocks that they were putting on. We blocked the A1M. Um, uh, with, with miners' transits and pickets and stopped the motorway uh, in retaliation. And also because they were stopping us um, going into Nottingham uh, on the motorway, this became not just a, a question of trade union rights, but civil rights. So then we could pick it anywhere. It didn't have to be a coal mine. We could stop the Humber Bridge, for example. There's no coal mines on the Humber side. Um, so we could move anywhere and use direct action tactics in that, in that thing. Um, but what they did was they pursued us back into the villages. So then the, the pit villages started to resemble Derry and Belfast during the uh, direct occupation, with the police riding about, helicopters with uh, searchlights looking through people's gardens, raids ki kicking your door in, looking for, looking for pickets, harassment of people on the streets, and, and being uh, as absolutely obnoxious and offensive um, as they could to the community as a whole. Um, and that's when we started to see um, those scenes, really, um, of, of, uh, of, of mass police occupation um, and terror ter terrorising villages, where there might be one or two scabs in, in a workforce of thousands. Um, and I think people famously know the kinds of tactics that the police used um, as Christmas approached, waving £20 notes out the window and kids' toys and other things like that. <coughs> Sorry, it still, it still offends me that they did that. Um, but I think I have to, uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention the most important aspect of this mobilisation, and that was the role that was played by women. Now, the most pickets we ever managed to assemble 
was at Orgreave on the 18th of June, and we had 20,000 pickets there, matched roughly by the cops. But there were 180,000 miners on strike, mostly for 12 months, 180,000. So 160,000 never went near a picket line. Well, until the police actually came into the villages, they never went near a picket line. So what was it held them on strike for 12 months? And the fact is that the women had set up the most amazing international network of support systems that kept people fed, that kept people with a fire on, that took kids to the seaside, organised school dinners, organised uh, stuff like that. We had some help off the council who ran the um, school dinners during the, during the school holidays, so you still got, went to school and got your dinner. But the, the um, extent of the women's involvement in that, it can't be overestimated. We wouldn't have lasted 12 weeks had it not been for the way the women... Some of the women went picketing as well, by the way. They didn't just confine themselves to the, uh, to the kitchen. And these new experiences later on led to lots of marriages breaking up, not because the people had fell out, but because people had new horizons and experienced different, different things and, and, uh, about it. I think one of the enduring myths was that this was some kind of labour movement charge of the Light Brigade and that we had you know, no, no chance and it was like a noble savage. I mean, again, utter bollocks. On three occasions, we came within a nuts bollock of winning the, the dispute on three occasions. In June, they sat down and nego to negotiate because, uh, because of the imminence of the national dock strike, which was blacking the movement of coal and iron ore, etc. Um, and we came down to one word disagreement. That was whether the coal could be beneficially developed or not. And Arthur wanted that word beneficially taken out because he thought that meant economically developed or something like that. Now, I mean, it's easy to be wise in retrospect, and I personally would have signed that agreement because it withdrew all the pit closure programme. It offered uh, amnesty for all of the men who'd been sacked. Um, it secured agreement on the plan for coal, which guaranteed 145 million tonne of coal would be, we could produce 145 million tonne of coal. And if we'd nailed down the question of who decides in the end what's beneficial, if we'd nailed that down harder to make an independent binding decision, then even if we'd lost some, it would have taken 12 months to take each pit through the procedure. So you're talking, if you wanted to, you're talking 50 years if they wanted to close down the 50 pits. And many of the pits had less than 10 years coal in them. So we would have won. But Arthur wanted a copper-bottomed agreement, and unfortunately, there were people to Maggie's right, believe it or not. Thatcher had advisers to her right, David Hart, some of the people from the state's counterinsurgency teams. Um, I mean, it's interesting that Stella Remington, who was head of MI5 during the whole period of the strike, says her two briefs were the National Union of Mine Workers and the Provisional IRA. So she must have been tickled pink with me because I was a former Sinn Féin member at the time of being on the miners' executive. So <laughs> there must be an interesting file there somewhere. But um, the, uh, the, um, the second time was when the um, steel workers started to move, wanted to bring coke from the wharfs. And the dockers' union said that they wouldn't allow anybody but a union docker to move freight, and the union doctors weren't going to ship black, black goods. Down at Immingham, um, coal terminal, they brought scabs in, non-union dockers, to <coughs> unload the coke. And a national dock strike followed. And Keith Joseph says, and again we find out later, had the national dock strike lasted one more week, she was ready to concede the whole shooting match in Caboodle, because we had a generalised a generalised strike movement, which included the seafarers, the dockers, the railway workers, and lots of other key people. And because most of the power stations weren't accepting scab fuel, only those down south. So she was ready to concede that. Unfortunately, uh, the, they went away. Keith Joseph signed an agreement in blood that you know, only union dockers would unload dock, uh, freight. Uh, registered ports would all be under the control of the dock labour scheme etc. Unfortunately, what happened then was that the Immingham dockers, who were members of the union, then decided to scab. And the Immingham dockers started to unload the scab fuel. 
And uh, Ron Todd, to his credit, went down with the Aslef vice chairman to plead with these dockers to hold the line. And they pelted them, pelted the stage with iron bolts. Ron Todd got, it was the leader of the transport union, got hit in the head uh, and had blood running down his face, appealing to these dockers. So people who say that he was a bureaucratic bastard and didn't do enough, I think Ron did a fair amount, to tell you the truth, in trying to bring those dockers out. Uh, there was another brief dock strike up in Scotland when a scab ship was again going to be unloaded and the dock strike started again. But you couldn't do anything about the fact that union dockers were unloading the fuel. You could only do something if non-union dockers were, were doing it. So that was the second time. And the last time, of course, was when NACODs, uh, the, the, the shot firers and supervisory, safety supervisory unions, voted by 80%. The second time they voted by a majority, by the way, but 80% to take strike action alongside of us against pit closures. And Thatcher called the cabinet together and said, the game's up, the game's up, because the, no pit can work in Britain. We can't keep that trickle of scab fuel going through. The whole thing's locked down, right to concede the lot. And we drew up a joint agreement. Um, we drew up a joint agreement between NACODs, the NUM, and the management union, BACM, on the withdrawal of the pit closures, no victimizations, plan for coal, all of that stuff. And we give it to ACAS to take the government. In between the time of handing it to ACAS, NACODs went away and made their own piss corner agreement without us, which gained us nothing whatsoever. It never saved one single pit. The agreement they made gave the last word on whether a pit would stay open or not to them, to the coal board, not to any independent arbitration. It wouldn't be binding. Thatcher says in her autobiography that she thought it was a good idea not to make it too clear uh, that this agreement didn't mean that somebody else would decide other than the coal board. Now, we always think that the deputies, as we call them, are pretty thick. But you've got to be transparently thick not to see that that wasn't going to give you, give you anything at all. Uh, after, the, after November, really, um, we had nowhere left, left to go, really. Um, and just to summarise, really, in the 12 months, 9,808 were arrested, 10,372 were charged, including three killings, actually four if we include Keith Frogson, who was a union miner who had his head chopped off 20 years after the strike by a scar. Um, four criminal damages with intent to endanger life, three explosive charges, five threats to kill, 200 imprisoned, 882 sacked for violence and sabotage, 967 for striking, 20,000 miners hospitalized, two killed on the picket line, one killed by a scab, as I say, 20 years later. Three died digging for coal uh, uh, alongside, uh, among them, two minus children. Um, three suicides by men unable to uh, stand it anymore, but un unwilling to break the strike. The total cost of the strike, in terms of the decimation of communities and where we are now um, in those areas, is reaching something in the region of £100 billion. But you know... Arthur Scargill always says we didn't lose. And we always say, well, thank God for that, because <laughs> <laughs> if that was winning, you know, I'd hate to know what bloody losing was like. But he's, he's not completely mad, not on that issue anyway. He's not completely mad, because when the dust had settled in 1986, all right, we'd lost 100,000 jobs, but guess what? 80% of all power in Britain to the grid came from coal. And more than 80% of that coal was mined by union miners. And in 1986, we held a national ballot for industrial strike action and got an 86% vote yes for strike action. And the alarm bells started ringing in Whitehall that the only way you could drive the miners' union out of the industry was to destroy the industry, lock, stock, and barrel. And they're not bothered about coal because they import 50 million tonnes of the stuff. 50 million tonnes of coal and they closed down 50, 50 million tonnes capacity of British, of British mining. And now, as you know, the, the end game we can see. Three pits left in Britain now. Two of them announced closure last week because the government isn't prepared to give them 15 million quid to tide them over the differences in exchange rates. But they've given a billion pound to the uh, underground coal gasification fracking company and also given them a tax exemption at a time when 
coal power has a 50% fossil fuel tax on it. So, you know, old habits die hard. For us, the fight was absolutely worth having. And if you look at those communities now and the, the loss and the devastation that we have there, because mining wasn't just something we did, it was, it was something we were. It was a tradition and a way of life and a way of thinking about things. And um, it's heartbreaking, and I wish, there was a, I wish there was an optimistic note to end on, except that I've called me book Ghost Dancers after the Native Americans, who, after the Indians were wiped out militarily, there was an attempt to change who they were and make them white men, and make them lose their traditions and forget who they, forget who they were, and they started doing this, this ghost dance. And if we carried on doing this dance and they wore their traditional costumes, that the buffalo would come back to the prairie, the white man would lose his power. And at the Durham Miners Gala, the last pit closed in 1994, 100,000 people <laughs> turned out behind those colliery bands with the lodge banners. And I thought, ghost dancers. If we keep marching and we keep bashing that drum and we keep playing those tunes, Arthur Scargill will walk on water again. The Tories will never, ever get elected. You know, <laughs> and we'll turn back to coal away from nuclear power. Only joking, but that's an aspiration. So thanks very much. I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. If anybody wants to. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, thanks a million, Dave. Just before I, I um, throw it open for your own comments and questions, etc., a couple of uh, uh, announcements I just want to make. First of all is the, the usual appeal for uh, people to dip in their pockets. Um, as you know, putting on this book fair does cost quite a deal of money. In fact, about €5,000 will be spent uh, over the course of the weekend in terms of uh, the build-up to it in terms of putting it on. So there is a donation box at the welcome desk on, on your, uh, at the front door, so I would encourage you to please dip in your pocket and throw something into that on your way out later on. Um, there are a couple of people at the moment distributing feedback forms and contact forms and it's, it's good for us to get feedback as to how people, you know, find the sessions that we put on and ideas that you may have for future book fairs. So please uh, make sure you fill that form in, get it back to us, uh, either leave it um, with the volunteers who are handed the forms out or uh, there's a box at the door that you can pop them into on your way out. Uh, two other things I just wanted to uh, let you know about. There has been an addition to the meeting schedule. Um, the, the, probably everybody has a copy of the meeting schedule that you got at the door on the way out or the way in. Um, at 7.30 this evening, there's an extra addition to it. At 7.30 this evening, the flow and tide, Selma Jane James is hosting a talk on uh, organising sex workers. So people might be interested in going along to that. And finally, the last announcement is to let you know, again, it's on the, um, the uh, meeting thing, the post book fair benefit party, uh, five euros donation in, in the flowing tide at nine o'clock tonight. Um, having given all those announcements and uh, appealed for your money and all the rest, uh, I'm going to throw it open to the floor for comments, questions, if you have particular questions you'd like to ask Dave, your own memories, either if you lived in Britain at the time or some, I know a lot of people may have been involved in um, support stuff around here, or if you're too young to remember it all, what legacy has, co has, has come true and that people feel is, is uh, influencing where we're at today, or just general questions or comments people have. Yeah, go ahead. Cheers. What we'll do is, if, if there's a few comments from the floor, we'll get Dave to come back in then, rather than uh, give him a, a, a few minutes to get his, his voice back. Anyway, I have Mary next, and then James, then Mark.
Let's come back on those. Well, uh, checking the last one first, really, I mean, the, there was obviously, to me, a design to break the trade union movement where it mattered, which was in terms of the, the traditional proletariat, the, the, the productive workers, the workers that worked in steel, coal, engineering, shipbuilding, manufacture, the kind of institutions you'd want if you wanted to produce an alternative system. Um, and there was the switch to money speculation. I mean, there's a lot of debate going on about a referendum in Scotland for independence. It appeared to me that the southeast of England declared independence a bloody long time ago, and nobody asked us. And that's the only place where there's wealth, and it's the only place it sucks the whole life out of the rest of the country, goes into that you know, money speculation, playing the stock exchange, all the spivs and barra boys doing the sh stuff in the stock exchange, you know? And the, the rest of the country has become a service, service industry, flipping burgers and McDonald's and working in supermarkets and working part-time, with the exception of the car industry, perhaps, which has seen a revitalization. And I, I, you know, it might sound a bit uh, absurd, but I think that's a European, that's a European trend that you shift the exploitation to the third world where people don't have strong unions, where they don't have strong safety standards, and you produce your steel and your coal and, or even your silicon chips and all the other stuff out there, and you leave Europe basically decimated of industry and also, of course, decimated of the strength of taking it back off them. If we haven't got it, I mean, you can't go and tell it to go and occupy McDonald's. Well, you can really, but you can't really build a socialist system on occupying McDonald's. You can't even make decent food by occupying. <laughs> but, uh, so I, 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 I think that that, that that was behind the whole, the, the whole thing, and that's why we've got such wretched unemployment. And I mean, I don't think people realise, you know, the, the, mining the, the most deprived areas in Britain aren't in the city black areas. The most deprived areas are in the valleys and in the north, among the traditional white working class. You know, where we have the highest rates of infantile mortality, the lowest life expectancy, the lowest educational attainment. You know, it, the, the list is endless, the highest number of benefit dependency. All of these things are in a huge catalogue. Um, and worse than that, of course, is a loss of hope. Because people, when, I mean, we were poor in the 20s and we were poor in the 30s. But we always thought we'd come back because we knew that the miners' union would get strong again. And people believed that labour offered some kind of future. People believed in communism and socialism and anarchism and now people have had the bloody living daylight kicked out of them they don't see any hope and that's the most damning thing about the situation we're in i think the um eu i wouldn't touch the uh, the um the euro with a barge pole <laughs> personally and be because it's a you know we can debate the eu it's a, it's just a form of classical dictatorship i mean it's it's more blatantly a dictatorship than normal parliamentary procedures, where they just do what they want. In that particular, I mean, you don't elect the government. No, There's a. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. What the, the No. If no, if, but if if there is a, a referendum, um, and Labour, not that I think Labour's any good anyway, but Labour shot itself in the foot by declaring that it will not have a referendum, and people don't like that from the point of view of who do you think you are. Yeah. You know, we, we would like a little say on what goes on in our lives, and if there is a referendum, people will vote overwhelmingly um, to come out of Europe. Now, where you go after that, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> that is a different ball game. But what's happened in terms of the coal industry in Europe is. Um, there's an intention to get rid of the Polish coal industry, the German coal industry, the Spanish coal industry, as we've seen the big battles that have been in Spain. And they're offering, they're offering you, you know, five years. In the case of Britain, they're offering them um, £10 million if you agree to close those two pits. We'll give you £10 million to cut your throat. And in the rest of Europe, they're offering them, like, five years, but you have to agree that it's all going to go. And what's it going to be replaced by? Yeah. You know, the people have this... this belief in a nuclear future. I think people don't know that nuclear energy doesn't grow on trees. No. I think they think uranium is a bit, some benign thing you pick off the, out of the farmyard or something. They don't realise people actually mine the stuff. And it's finite. Uran the uranium will run out a thousand years before coal runs out. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it doesn't kill us all in the bloody long term. Okay, we're gonna, yeah, down the back there, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that's right. But, um, you know, the, the, the state's involvement in that strike is, is monumental. The, 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 there were two committees that were set up by Thatcher. One was called the Miscellaneous 57 Committee. The other one was called the Miscellaneous 101 Committee. And they linked the state's counterinsurgency forces, the, the anti-terrorist organisations, and the um, state security secretariat together. And had a standing meeting three times a week of the CEGB, the armed forces, the police forces, the media. They were all, they were all in, in on the thing to conduct that, conduct that action. And how far she was prepared to go, um, who knows. I tend not to think that there were provocateurs in terms of on the actual picket lines, but there were provocateurs in the sense of people, cops getting dressed up like miners with donkey jackets on and listening to what people were saying. 
and trying to because we. The, I don't want to go too much internal stuff, but you know, me and Arthur didn't agree at all about the strategies. All grieve was Arthur's baby, and it was a right cock up of the whole thing. And that's not the way we wanted to play it. We were playing a decentralised position where we wouldn't let the police know where we were going, where we'd turn up en masse and they'd be somewhere else. That was the game we were we were playing. Um, they 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 wanted to set that up so that we would all be there. So. Before that, we would keep it a secret wherever we were picketing. But you'd get cops turning up in the pubs, listening for people saying where they were going. You got cops working in petrol stations so they could calculate, because we used to pay the lads the petrol money, so they could calculate how much, how much they were putting in the tank to estimate where we were going to go to. Things like that, you know. And, of course, there were provocateurs from the point of view of taking notes, like they infiltrated the green movement and the, that, that kind of thing as well. But I tend to think that the cock-eyed people who threw bricks and hit us tended to be some of our people rather, rather, than, <laughs> rather than them. And, uh, you know, you could, why they didn't go and do it on the front rank, why they had to do it from the 20th rank, I, I, never, un, I never, under, never understood that. Um, did somebody ask me something else that I haven't mentioned yet? Um, yeah, like I say, um, you know, they had that Brigadier Sterling from his counter thing, you know, Sterling and, and Hart. Hart ran the counterinsurgency operation from Claridge's hotel, and he had access anywhere he wanted to, the War Office, the Ministry of Defence, and, you know, he, to, to his credit, Ned Smith, who was an old uh, vice chairman of the coal board, wouldn't stay in the same room as him. I mean, he used to come in wearing dark glasses and a uh, full-length leather coat and stuff like that, and Ned... Smith just thought he was a fucking lunatic. You know, he'd say, who, who's he? Who, who is he? And he could go anywhere. And in the end, McGregor only had Hart in with him. He wouldn't have any cobalt people in because he said, if ever I say anything here, Arthur Scargill knows within an hour what we've discussed. We have no doubt that Ned Smith was given, all, it was him who gave the, the list to Arthur in the first place. But um, no, there were some very, very suspicious people about at the time, evil people really, and, you know, she thought about, because we had the coal, coal at the pit head, even for all that, I mean, there's figures in my book that tell you how much coal was left. You know, there was only about six weeks' coal left at the pit head, uh, uh, um, at the power stations, so they were getting desperately short. It was costing them something like £50 million a day in oil. And now they get on about the aid that we got off, get, off the trade unions in, in Libya. I mean, Thatcher never tells you that they doubled the increase of oil coming from Libya in order to break the miners' strikes. He didn't mind dealing with Gaddafi in his big tent if it was putting the workers down, you know? But um, I, the, uh, she, she contemplated sending the army, and this is in the cabinet minutes as well, sending the army in to get the coal from the pit heads and from the, the solidarity uh, power stations that weren't going to let it be moved. And... No doubt on bended knee, people said, don't start using the army because if you start using the army, the army will have to defend them as well. And then we're going to start seeing the army confronting civilians on the streets of Britain. And, you know, she talked about tear gas and plastic bullets and all of that stuff. And all. If they'd started doing that to us, we already had a form of internment where people were put on remand in jail months and months and months before any case came up. People were getting rounded up. Uh, you know, and then let go in the end after never never had a charge. Um, but if it started firing plastic bullets and tear gas at were, I can assure you that we intended to hit them back with something harder than bricks, and we'd have been in a whole different situation. And the whole thing was on the edge. But as the man said up there, the thing that defeated us wasn't their, their strength; it was our weakness. It was the man who drove the scab lorry, the man that shifted the scab coal. It was at the end of the day, it was him that did it. It was the scabs that did it because if, the, if people had stood solid with us, we would have won. It's like the old wobbly song about there being no force stronger on earth than, than, than collective solidarity. And that's what, would have, uh, that's what would have clinched it. You know? Um, and in the 11th hour, you know, we were looking for some kind of cavalry to ride over the hill. And Norman Willis and the rest of the bloody traitors had no intention um, of supporting us. But then in 92, 93, you know, we came back again, that big movement that was led by the women, and that they, they, they had pit camps, they occupied pits, they occupied offices, um, they, had, they, they dug up uh, Heseltine's front garden with a bloody earth mover, you know, because the, <laughs> they were against open cast as well. And there were, uh, you know, there, there was massive actions there, and, and 12 million strike days, 
12 million workdays were lost in 92, 93 against a new wave of pit closures. But all they did was held their breath and let the movement pass by to some other thing. And uh, of course, the, the rest is history, as you say. You know. Okay, we'll take a few more. So we'll, yeah, yourself yeah. down to that. Yeah, um, I was in England at the time. I was a um, political activist, and I was a shop steward in uh, Rover Sully Love, mm -hmm. the Land Rover plant. And uh, just the briefest kind of remark when the, the Brumbos did bombs in Brighton, um, we had, I was shop steward then, and we had. Exactly, it's true. And that's a true story. It's true. And this wasn't from the most militant section of the working class. Anyway, I just, I just wanted to preface my remarks because when Patrick got into power and she did her St. Francis speech, <laughs> um, they had a plan which was already worked out. They were going after the union. That was their main target. They initially, in my opinion, went after Leyland. Um, yes. In, in and that was Labour. They had a strong mm. shop stewards movement in British Labour throughout West Midlands and beyond. And they went back there and they tried to take them out one by one. She didn't necessarily succeed, but she did have, they did have an impact. Um, when the minor strike took off, um, our pay plan was coming up. Um, at a, a mass meeting, over Sully Bowles, I had obviously been advocating for to go out with our pay claim alongside the miners, um, put out a leaflet in the plant, spoke at a mass meeting. Um, there was massive support for it. There was a, you know, people mm. remembered Salty Gates mm. um, when the whole of the West, the, the car plants in the West Midlands went out alongside the miners and, and stopped coal from moving. And that, that's what led to the victory. There was massive support for it, but I was shut down. Um, I was allowed to speak. When I got off the platform, I was marched off the planet. <laughs> That's how desperate they were from very early on to stop any kind of movement of support mm -hmm. towards the miners. Yeah. Um, and the problem for me, Dave, very early on, was Scargill went for support from the Labour Party. Um, admittedly from the left, but the left system was the most treacherous in, in the long run. Here are the ones you've got to watch, rather than the right. Um, you know your enemy is the right. The left say they support you, and then they say they did nothing, um, which is inevitable. But what was needed from early on, very early on, and I don't think Scarborough did it, was going for a triple alliance with the, the, the transport workers, the Dockers and, and the miners. Um, and he didn't, he didn't talk about it until it was very, I think, very late in the strike. I um, uh, set it up before. The ballot, I don't, I, I certainly didn't argue uh, that he should have had a ballot. Because once the, the, the pickets went out, that was an effective ballot. They, went, they, they voted with their feet. They put up pickets, and that was it. And you don't cross the picket line. Um, but I would also say there's another problem that I, you know, in retrospect, when I was looking back on this. Uh, the the NUM in Nottinghamshire, of course, was a, a, a scab, became a scab union. But there was a history in that in, in the yeah. NUM. You know, from the time when it was a federation to the time it became the National Union of Ireland. Spencerism in 26. And then they took Spencer and the scabs back into the NUM. And lo and behold, the same area in 84, 85, Packer is able to be used as a mm. Trojan horse to, to mm. smash the NUM and, and the strike. Um, so 
Well, you know, Jack London put out, uh, you know, put around the first of the drawing, uh, okay. the scab, the what a scab is, and all the rest of it. And yet the NUM allowed these guys back into the NUM. Um, I, anyway, uh, I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to speed up there, please. Yeah, thanks. The, the end result is, and I believe it then, and I believe it now, that what was missing, and a lot of people here might disagree with it, is. It is <laughs> and once again, a party. Margaret Thatcher had four political parties. If the working class don't have a political party, then they, they don't have a, uh, a weapon to be able to go beyond just the union fight, you know, and to okay. take it to smash the votes as the union. Thanks, William. Now, um it's just after 20 that we need to be finishing up here at a quarter to, or very shortly after, to, to prepare for the next room. So I have one other indication. I'm going to take that as the last contribution from the floor then, and then let Dave come back on those last couple of points, if that's okay. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, I'm kind of coming on this one, did it? Um, my, I was going to university when I went back to York in 1984, and I remember driving down the motorway past lines and lines of the policemen who were parked up for Orbury. Well, thanks, Paul. Give just two or three minutes, Dave, if you okay. can wrap it up in that piece. I'll, because I'll, I'll try and remember everything. First of all, you know, we could debate the question of a party for a long time. I, I don't happen to believe in this vanguard party, but you know, we should remember the other big defeat for the miners was in 1926, and you had a party. You had the Communist Party of Great Britain in 1926, and their slogan, if you remember from history, was "All power to the TUC General Council." Well, thanks. <laughs> because the TUC General Council stabbed us in the back after nine days, and the miners were left on their own for nine months. So that particular political party didn't do us any favours at, at that particular time. I tend to trust the organisation of the working class itself directly, rather than any bunch of Moses who come down from the mountain with a tablet of gold to tell us what to do. Even now, you'll see more of them than, than the life of Brian dishing out the tablets of gold, telling everybody what they should do. I'm <laughs> standing on that box doing that stuff. And unfortunately, there's no workers 
no workers around it. So while I believe that workers' organisations have to have politics and have to have perspective, I trust in the self-organisation of the workers themselves rather than, rather than um, political, political parties. And, you know, we did have a triple alliance. We set the triple alliance up a year before the start of the strike. We had regular meetings in every city in Britain with the transport unions, with the rail unions who give us unswerving solidarity, with the steel workers, etc. Unfortunately, again, I don't want to go into too much detail, Arthur misplayed the, the situation with the steel workers, and, and we ended up having the steel workers as enemies when we should have had them as friends. Um, but Bill Sears couldn't wait for to get on the other side. Bill Sears wanted to stab this triple alliance uh, in the back. He, he didn't believe in it. It was the rank and file that had imposed solidarity uh, on us. And the steel workers, up until April, weren't producing steel in solidarity with the miners. We had solidarity of the steel workers, and we had every right to expect to, to win. But when we had deliberate, organised scabbing by the ETPU and by other unions, which said, you know, the GMB, you know, said they weren't going to be used as battering rams for the, for the miners, etc. And we tried to argue with them that this fight wasn't about the miners. This fight was about organised labour and the comfort of the miners because we represented organised labour. You know, it, that, that was all it was about. It wasn't a trade dispute in that sense. It was a class dispute and, and we needed them to come off the, come off the, uh, the fence. Um, I think Tony Benn was genuinely... I mean, he's, he would have been the first person to admit that he'd made many mistakes in his life, not least he, he, he had been ori originally a great supporter of nuclear energy until he, he, he seen the errors of his ways there and was the first person... To, he'd be the first person to say so. And, you know, you can look at conspiracies and whatnot, but it was odd that Tony Benn wasn't in the position of uh, political power during the miners' strike because he'd been engineered out of that situation. And although he won the vote for the deputy leader of the party against Healy, the big union chief switched the ballot votes from the decisions of the conferences to supporting Healy against Ben because there's a very strong possibility. First of all, Ben would have got the Sedgefield constituency and the leader of the Labour Party during 1984 would have been Tony Benn. Now, you can speculate what would have happened, but I tend to think he'd have been a damn sight better than bloody Neil Kinnock was in terms of supporting the, uh, supporting the miners, you know, because um, he, he was, he was a, a, a good friend of the miners last off. And also just an honest and a nice bloke, I thought, personally, but, um, you know, you speak as you find, um, although we disagreed about every bloody thing in the, under the sun. Um, the Spencer, on that, there's no answer to it really. Is Spencer led a breakaway union in 1926. He took the Nottingham miners back to work. He made a scab organisation uh, called the Non-Political Industrial Union. They negotiated yellow dog deals. Um, they brought the army in, they brought the police in against the organisation of the miners' union in Nottingham and they behaved in exactly the way that, that, fought, that the people who followed them on um, in 1986 did when they set up the Union of Democratic Miners along the same lines. But here's the anomaly. In 1972 and in 1974, the Nottingham miners voted and struck alongside everybody else and didn't scab. So the key decisive thing there was the fact that we had a national day wage and their money was the same as our money in 72 and 74. And that's what goes grist to the mill. Because at the end of the day, trade unions are a little bit about self-interest, you know. A worker says, what's in it for me? We know it should be about solidarity and, and humanity, and, but a lot of unions are built on, we can get a better deal for you, because, you know, the job of unions, uh, I, I have nothing to stop unions overthrowing capitalism, I don't think, but the, jo the job of unions is to regulate the rate of exploitation. And, and, um, and we were doing that for the Nottingham miners. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult conundrum in Nottingham because at a time... I'll just tell you this little story. At the end of the bloody strike, after I had, had armies of violent pickets into Nottingham, overturned cars, set fire to bloody buildings and all the other stuff, um, they were on about forming the Union of Democratic Miners and breaking away from the NUM. And Arthur said, well, you know, there's room for every miner in the NUM as, as long as it's not the people who've led the UDM organisation. So I was sent back to bloody Nottingham to persuade these people to stay in the National Union of Mine Workers. And I addressed a heaving meeting of Harworth miners in Doncaster. And this guy gets up and he says, you're from Hatfield Pit, you. 
you set fire to our canteen. I said, you turned the car, my car over in the car park. And I went, and I was waiting for him to say, and you were with him. <laughs> and I said, hey, I can't condone that, you know. It's, uh, it was all in the heat of the moment. We should let bygones be bygones. <laughs> it's a difficult thing to play, that we didn't want a scab union inside the industry. And, and, and I think we thought if we took them back in, we could bloody punish them later on. I think that was the thing. And, of course, in the strike solid areas, we got rid of all the scabs. All the scabs were kicked out of the industry, you know. And, um, and, and even yet, scabs... I mean, when I first moved to Yorkshire, scabs who'd scabbed in 1926, this is in 1966, weren't allowed in any of the clubs or pubs or shops or anything. And the same thing happened in 84 and 85 because, you know, it dies hard being a scab, a scab for the rest of your life. Now, we used to say... Miners won't always be poor, but a scab will always be a bloody scab. Yeah.